Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Take Stock Live, our weekly investor webinar series, live every Wednesday, 15 minutes after market close. Next week, we'll be featuring uh, Musgrove Bio Biologics, um, CSE listed company, MGRO, as well as iSoft Technologies, ISFT, and maybe something uh, else, but maybe some surprise guests. Uh, we will let you know. Um, we'd like to thank the TMX Group, the TFX Venture Exchange, our event partner, for keeping the conversation between companies and investors going in these very unusual times. We'd also like to recognize the vital support provided by our core sponsors, Faskin, MNP, Lee Jones Gable, Olympia Trust, Dealmaker, and the CSE, who helped launch the forum back in 2014. We'd also like to thank our extended network for their support in launching this new initiative. Calgary Meg and CIM, Sterling Merchant Capital, Conduit IR, The Newswire, Investment Pitch Media, Kitco, and many others. I'll now turn the mic over to my colleague, Mark Francis. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Raj. And for working the wee hours from Delhi in order to make this happen. Welcome all of you, our attendees and guest presenters. Note, first of all, our disclaimer, this presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to buy or sell stock or shares or bonds. Take stock and its principles, Raj Joshi and, and I, may have equity investments in companies we invite to present, make no representation or investment or other recommendation in regards to these presenting or any other companies, and you should do due diligence and seek professional investment advice. So a couple of housekeeping matters, as normal, the chat board will not be utilized live in this session. You can still type and send messages, which will be followed up on by the respective companies post session. So please be clear as to whom it is addressed. We normally accept questions for consideration up to two days in advance of each session. Today, we have guests from two companies active in the cannabis industry. Each company will have a presentation with their PowerPoint, and then we will move to our customary panel discussion with Q&A, uh, moderated by James Furterer of MNP. Each company will have a presentation with their PowerPoint, and then we will, after the Q&A, um, uh, we will we'll move on and finalize. We encourage you to connect with the companies directly in order to get more detailed information. Contact details for the presenters can be found on our website, takestocklive.com. So today we have Jennifer Drake, Chief Operating Officer of AYR Strategies, a US-based cannabis company listed as AYR.A on CSE. Ms. Drake, a former managing director at Goldman Sachs with extensive M&A experience, uh, institutionalized the businesses of several multi-billion dollar asset management firms, ensuring compliance within complex regulatory frameworks and creating a foundation for accelerated growth. And we also have with us Arthur Kwan, president and CEO of Canna Income Fund, a private investment firm focused on the cannabis sector. Arthur brings over 20 years of investment banking, capital markets, and private equity experience. He was involved early in the cannabis sector as an investor, financier, and advisor, and currently sits on the boards of High Tide Ventures, Newbridge Global Ventures, and STEM Holdings, all cannabis companies. So let's start with you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for taking the time uh, to listen to our presentations today. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, AIR and who we are, uh, our profile. Um, we're a multi-state operator in the US cannabis sector uh, and we're vertically integrated in the states where we operate. So that means unlike uh, Canadian operators who tend to specialize in one part or the other of the value chain, we do everything from growing uh, cannabis through to extracting and processing, creating uh, consumer products, uh, gummies, chocolates, et cetera, through to selling. Um, 
vertical integration is required almost in the US uh, if you want to capture the most margin that you can um, because given the federal illegality of cannabis, even if it's okay on a state by state basis, even if it's legal on a state by state basis, it means the THC can't cross state lines. So essentially every state is an island and you need to be vertically integrated within each state in order to capture uh, the most margin. Um, so we're vertically integrated. Uh, we are current, we currently have a presence in two states, Massachusetts and Nevada. But even with those two states only, we have amongst the highest revenue, EBITDA, and one of only one of are one of only two cash flow positive companies in the US MSO space. So that's because our operators, uh, our businesses in Massachusetts and Nevada are established operators. It's not that we haven't just gotten licenses and then building them out. We have established operations that have been cash flow positive for a number of years in both Massachusetts and Nevada um, and have a strong amount of experience in each of those states. When we get our deck, I'll walk you through some of our metrics that indicate that sort of give an in indication of why our business is so powerful. Um, some of the key metrics that, um, that we look at are sales for e in each of our dispensaries, and our dispensaries are the most productive dispensaries by far across the US, according not just to us, but to BDS Analytics, which is one of the major uh, analytics companies and data companies in the US. Um, so what produ productivity in terms of dispensary sales, uh, we do some of the most volume anywhere in the state of Nevada. Uh, we do over 4,000 transactions per day, which is a huge number of transactions across our five dispensaries. Um, uh, in addition to our excellent sales per dispensary and transactions per dispensary, um, we have very strong yields in our cultivation um, and excellent testing results across the board, whether it's our Massachusetts results or our Nevada results. This is because our management team and our operators really are our best in class. Um, and that is exceptionally important in the cannabis business. Um, in our view, people are your most important asset in most businesses, but that goes even more uh, for the cannabis sector. Um, this is the most people intensive industry you can imagine. It's certainly the most people intensive industry we've ever, the management team here at AIR, uh, we've ever experienced. Um, and within that, um, within this sort of people intensive nature, it goes everywhere from the top in terms of having to be an excellent manager, all the way down to needing to have excellent growers, excellent retailers. And that's really difficult if you, if you can imagine um, if you're a vertically integrated company. And that's why um, we believe that people are absolutely the most important asset uh, that we have. Talking a little bit about our senior management team because it really is a differentiator for us. Um, there are other businesses in the US cannabis space that will say um, that they are run by really strong institutional professionals. Um, but I, we, would, we would argue that ours is the only cannabis, US cannabis multi-state operator uh, with, truly, uh, a tr with management team that's truly filled with professionals that have a proven track record of achievement, both in blue chip companies, um, as well as in more entrepreneurial environments across the board amongst senior managers. Um, whether it's myself, uh, having been a manager, managing director at Goldman, um, or our CEO, John Sandelman, who was previously the president, president of Bank of America Securities. Across the board, our senior management team has demonstrated both success at the blue trip institutional level, as well as a history of success being on the ground entrepreneurs. Thanks very much, everyone. Let's just jump ahead. Our safe harbor, which you can read at your leisure. Um, here you can see our uh, our current states and some key metrics regarding each of our different each of the um, two states where we operate, Massachusetts and Nevada. I think. Let's skip ahead to the metrics I was talking about earlier uh, the de that demonstrate the power of our business in terms of our um, $12 million per dispensary at, on average in terms of revenue. That's, you can see, best in class and well above uh, our peers 
as well as some of the key metrics for our business, whether it's those 4,000 plus transactions that I talked about, um, or some of our production square feet and annual flower production. Um, these are the key stats for our business, but we're very, very focused, especially uh, on the people and on the management team. I think this slide, who we are and who we aren't, is where I wanna spend most of the rest of the time this morning, um, or this afternoon rather, sorry, um, because it really focuses on what differentiates our business from the business of many other multi-state operators. We talked already now uh, about the management team, about how that is very key because of the people intensive aspect of the business, because it's very difficult to be vertically integrated because of all the difficult things you need to do in, uh, in one space. Um, but also in addition, um, our focus on profitability and on cash flow is quite differentiated and has been a focus for us from day one. So from the minute we started our company, we knew that uh, cannabis in the US was a highly regulated um, consumer products business um, that was also extremely capital intensive. Uh, so that, in, in, and in our experience in the markets, any capital intensive business needs to be very focused on cash flow and high quality operations. Um, this is a little bit different to many other multi-state operators that are um, predominantly a connect, connect collection rather of licenses that need to build out those licenses with a really high degree of capex and execution risk. For us, the execution risk is much lower because our businesses are already established, already profitable, already generating cash flow. And as we see 2020 progress, and especially in light of all the difficulties globally with COVID, um, we're seeing businesses that have that stability, have that profitability and have that cash flow really, really be the cream of the crop and have that cream of the crop, those cream of the crop businesses rise to the top in terms of true execution and in terms of being the market favorites. Now, as we were presented COVID, we can't, we frankly were a little bit unlucky. Our two states, Massachusetts and Nevada, um, are some of the most profitable states to be in, but they also had the most restrictive regulatory response back in March to the COVID epidemic. Um, but this was a great opportunity for us to really shine and show our operating chops um, into these headwinds. Um, specifically, we essentially retooled our entire technology and business model in Nevada um, uh, within the space of a couple of weeks, turning a storefront only business into a delivery only business by the middle of April, and then turning that delivery business back into a curbside pickup and storefront business by the middle of May. Um, this essentially has put us in a position to be nearly where we were back in February in terms of revenue and above where we were in terms of EBITDA um, for Nevada as an indication of how substantial um, our operating prowess is. Now, we really believe that this type of this type of excellent operational skill is going to be what differentiates us and other MSOs that are the best in breed from the rest of the pack. And we believe that will happen throughout 2020. Um, and with us, we're in, we're in addition, an excellent, excellent value from a valuation standpoint. Um, and so we look at 2020 as an opportunity for shareholders both to take advantage of excellent valuation with us, excellent operational skill um, and um, and the ability to grow a very strong business to a larger footprint through consolidation, which we expect to happen in you know, really like quite quite like hotcakes in the sector for the rest of this year. Very good. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Yeah. And now Arthur Kwan, Canna Income Fund. Um, my name is Arthur Kwan and I'm the CEO and founder of Canna Income Fund. Uh, we're a private investment fund uh, focused on the cannabis sector. Uh, one of the things that we portray ourselves on is a safer way to play cannabis. And uh, we employ several risk mitigation strategies uh, and, that I'll go through. 
One of which is we like to target investments that rank higher on the capital structure. So what that means is we have a strong bias towards senior secured loans with warrants, uh, secured convertible debenture units, and gross overriding royalties. So that if anything happens to the um, our investee companies, we're usually the first guys to get paid back. A little bit more about uh, our our team. Um, myself, I, I'm based in Calgary. I uh, have about 20 years of investment experience. I started in 1997. Uh, with TD Asset Management as an investment analyst. And then from there, I moved on to Scotia Capital in their investment banking department. I stayed on uh, as an investment banker with uh, a few other firms up until 2015 before moving over to the cannabis sector. Um, my partner who's on the call here today is Michael Young, who's the chief operating officer, uh, 17 years of capital markets experience spanning equity research, investment banking, and institutional sales. Uh, Don Short is our portfolio manager. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is corporate governance and transparency. And so we've contracted Quest Investment Fund Management out of Vancouver uh, to act as our investment fund manager and portfolio manager. Uh, Terry Zamaro, our CFO, has uh, over 20 years of accounting and auditing experience. Uh, one of the things that we bring to the table is uh, we're in the deal flow of uh, private companies. You know, we, we, we don't usually invest in public companies because, you know, to be honest, you guys can do that yourself. Where we add value is um, we're in the deal flow of private equity and private debt investments that your average investor may not have access to. And to help us do that, um, we put together a board of directors and advisors of senior executives of cannabis companies. So for example, Raj Grover, he's the CEO of High Tide, he's based in Calgary. Uh, Jeremy Ross, he's the president of Opus 3 Capital, uh, venture capital uh, firm, and he's a former director of Speakeasy Cannabis Club. He's based in Vancouver. Ronan Levy, he's a lawyer by background, and he's with Trade Biosciences. Cliff Stark, uh, CEO of Franchise Cannabis, he, he commutes between Montreal and Toronto. And Brie Yu, um, he's the co-founder and director of uh, Candera Ventures, which is now um, part of Decibel Cannabis. He's a uh, clinical pharmacist by background, and he's based in Edmonton. So you can see that we have guys uh, stationed across uh, Canada. Uh, we, we have a three year track record, you know, as uh, a lot of people on this call knows the cannabis sector was hit pretty hard last year, but I'm proud to say that we were one of the few cannabis investment funds that actually posted a positive return uh, last year. We returned 12%. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our fund features, but we do pay a dividend as well on a quarterly basis. Uh, we do have an established track record, as I mentioned. Uh, we were early investors in companies like Afria, Amro Health, and Tinley um, back in 2017 as part of a partners fund. Um, Canna Income Fund was formed in January of 2018, and we uh, the original strategy was to make early stage investments in uh, pre-IPO companies. We shifted that strategy uh, last year to incorporate more income producing uh, investments. Uh, here's some case studies of actual returns that we made on, on some investments. Um, two are realized and one is unrealized. Uh, the company on the right is a company called Scientis Pharma. Um, we, our fund has a heavy bent towards um, uh, pharmaceutical and medical cannabis. Um, I talked a little bit about our risk mitigation strategies. Uh, as you recall, the first way that we mitigate risk is we, we try to structure investments that rank higher on the capital stack, such as senior secured loans with warrants. The second way that we mitigate risk is we diversify the portfolio across the entire value chain. So currently in the portfolio, we have 20 investments spanning cultivation, extraction, processing, ancillary services, and retail dispensaries. Uh, so when you invest in our fund, you're not getting that single company um, uh, risk and exposure. You're getting a diverse uh, portfolio. The third way that we mitigate risk is we also diversify geographically. Uh, so currently, our investments touch Canada, U.S., Jamaica, the Netherlands, and Germany. 
Uh, we're currently looking at um, potential investments in other locations, uh, such as Israel and uh, Colombia. Uh, we are doing an offering uh, uh, for the fund right now via offering memorandum. For those of you that are interested in getting a copy of the offering memorandum, please uh, uh, contact us after the uh, webinar. Um, the, the you know couple things, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do pay a six percent dividend on a quarterly basis. Um, we also have liquidity in the sense that we have a redemption periods uh, every quarter. <laughs> Uh, industry growth, I think, um, you know, I won't dive um, into this in too much detail, but according to um, the several industry studies up here in Canada, it could be a $22 billion potential market size if you include, you know, edibles, beverages, uh, the pharmaceutical side, and that's just beginning. Um, some of the medical benefits, um, you know, we have a lot of research going into the uh, cannabis sector, and here's some of the ailments that they you know, they're looking to to treat. There's a company called GW Pharma that made history because they were the first uh, uh, pharmaceutical company to have an FDA approved uh, drug derived from cannabinoids. And that uh, it's used to treat epilepsy in children. Um, I, I like to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and cannabis because it's, it's obviously very timely. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that, uh, you know, we're seeing increasing sales um, on the retail level. And I don't know if guys are, um, you know, bored at home or they're, you know, they're anxious mm -hmm. or stressed out. But we have seen, um, you, you know, market uh, uh, increases in cannabis sales and a couple, you know, good, uh, good news items. Um, you know, I'm aware of several licensed producers that have uh, Lend Health Canada uh, Access Lab um, capacity for COVID-19 testing. And I know of another company that uh, has donated ethanol to make its hand sanitizer. A um, couple key takeaways of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and how that affects the fund um, and the market situation. You know, we're currently investing more in the private side and, and you know, we haven't seen valuations this low in a few years. Um, we've high graded our investment criteria to include revenue and cash flow uh, to, again, to decrease that risk. And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Mark and James, who will open it up for a panel discussion. That's my contact information. I, again, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. With that, I'll pass it to Mark. Thank you, Arthur. And now we will bring on James Furter, and uh, we'll also bring back Jennifer Drake. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, James is a senior audit partner with our very long-standing sponsor, MNP, uh, and he is a specialist in the cannabis space. For those of you who don't know MNP, it is the fifth largest CPA firm in Canada, and since uh, 2013 has worked with more than 100 cannabis companies as an advisor or auditor. So thank you, James, for joining us today and over to you. Well, thank you, Mark, and I appreciate the opportunity to be the moderator for today's session. So Jennifer, since you got to go first in presenting, I figured you should go first in answering the questions. So Canada is obviously way behind relative to the US and the rollout of edibles and everything else, because we just approved it in Canada in uh, late of 2019. But as a cannabis retailer that operates both in Nevada and Massachusetts, what are some of the product and consumer trends that you can share with us that we may see in Canada? Well, I will say that even though edibles have been around and, and a few products have been around for a long time in the U.S., flour is still the most popular product by far. Um, flour represents over 50% of most state sales. Um, California is a bit of an exception. But in our states, particularly, and this is interesting, post-COVID, as sales have gone up, um, we've seen more of those sales focused on flour. Uh, so that's still the most important product. Uh, although everyone does um, think that, let's say, five, ten, ten years from now, as cannabis becomes more and more mainstream, we'll have more interest in some of those infused products like edibles, um, even vaping products, uh, because they are just more convenient, more uh, kind of have a little bit more of a discretion element to their consumption. Um, and as form factors change over time, um, 
we'll probably be able to bring in more and more consumers who are newer to the, newer to the sector. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Arthur, this is a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I did have an opportunity to review your OM. And one of the interesting things is about your company is you're very diversified in terms of your investment. So you invest in cultivation, extraction, distribution, ancillary services, and pharmaceuticals. So you, you cover it all. But what part of the value chain do you currently see ha has, is having the greatest opportunity and why right now? Yeah, no, that's a great question, James. And, you know, we are active managers, so we'll overweight or underweight a particular subsector of the value chain where we see, see fit. Right now, um, we like to overweight what I like to call the downstream portion of the value chain. because uh, And the reason why we like this is, is because it's a short timeline to uh, real revenue, cash flow, and earnings. You know, we're sort of pa past the point of uh, pre-revenue, pre-cash flow sort of business concept companies. Uh, now, having said that, I do think having a vertically integrated strategy is, uh, is just as important as a company can control costs and quality. So I, I think, you know, a few com public companies that have utilized this uh, strategy well um, include Trulief, uh, GTI or Green Thumb Industries and Air Strategies. You know, I, I think, you know, where you're able to have your own cultivation facility, um, and do part of the processing or extraction and then write down the value chain to the, you know, to the retail dispensaries. I think that's where you, you're able to capture most of the margin. Now, building on that, Jennifer, is obviously one of your, one of the gear company's strategies is to continue with vertical integration. In Canada, we kind of are seeing the opposite where some LPs are starting to outsource, particularly the processing of oils to third parties and everything else. What challenges and opportunities did you see with becoming vertically integrated? Well, I will say being vertically integrated is, is difficult because you have to be really good at all of these disparate parts of the value chain, whether it's growing, branding and retail. Um, you don't normally have all of these that's in one company. So it is a challenge. But as Arthur said, it is one of the only ways that you can really control your costs consistently and control the quality of your product. And as we ultimately move to more of a consumer products and branded type solution, and that's probably many, many years from now, um, but as we ultimately move in that direction, one of the most important things is to have a consistent, high quality consumer experience. And right now, one of the only ways to really guarantee that is to be vertically integrated and control your value chain. Because, and I feel like you guys in Canada know this, it's not as easy to grow and process marijuana as you think. No. Uh, it's definitely with all of the, with all of the limitations on modern agricultural techniques, it's really tough. And so if you're going to have a strong, high quality product that can be an excellent branded product um, in the future, right now, you really need to be able to control your supply chain. Perfect, thank you. So I'll ask you, Arthur, because um, everybody is kind of wondering what 2020 will the year end or end up looking like. And so appreciate what your thoughts or what you're forecasting for 2020, particularly given uh, what's happening with COVID and everything else. Yeah, no, this this has been a very unique year and uh, uh, very much of a roller coaster ride, as everyone can appreciate. I think 2020 will be an inflection point for the industry where the good operators will get separated um, from the bad operators and uh, or should I say not so good operators. And I think the good operators will prevail and the not so good operators will either fall by the wayside or get um, get vended into a bigger entity or gobbled up. So, for example, there's there's over 100 companies on my ticker screen um, at the office, and I'm willing to argue that a good portion of them shouldn't be public in the first place. So in my opinion, 2020 will be a year of consolidation and where sad stories um, uh, will bound to happen as cannabis companies move through the next phase of the, uh, of the industry life cycle. So what I mean by that is asset rich cash poor companies will need solutions to survive. And, um, you know, as always, cash flow, ideally positive cash flow is king these days. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see the industry heading. Yeah, we could not agree more with you. We um, uh, we very much have 
believes 2020 would be a year of reckoning in general for the cannabis industry and COVID just accelerates that even more. In fact, you even saw, you saw green growth brands uh, pop right today. Uh, mm -hmm. So another company going in, uh, in cannabis going into distress. We, especially given our background, many of our senior management come from uh, a finance background with a lot of distressed experience. So we have been waiting for this day. Uh, we did not go all through all right. of the effort to build our company to be a two-state operator. And we've been waiting for this opportunity to take advantage and consolidate. Um, and prices have gotten cheaper and cheaper over the 12 months since we've been operating as a public company. Uh, and we do think that, as Arthur says, with COVID, you're going to start to see people who operate well and execute like we do um, rise to the top. And we feel very fortunate to be in a position where we've bought all of the companies that we currently have in our portfolio at very good prices, sort of three-ish times uh, forward EBITDA expectations. And now we have the opportunity to buy at very good prices again to expand our footprint beyond our initial state. So couldn't agree more with all of your comments. Yeah, so Jennifer, is it is it safe to say that um, you're seeing a lot more deal flow um, that come across your desk, potential acquisition targets or consolidation opportunities for air? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say when first when COVID first hit, uh, let's call it you know after the first week or so of March, you did see things slow down as you saw it globally slow down as people were starting to their business. And they're people, right? I mean, the most important thing for us is our people, as I said before, um, but also always for businesses, the most important thing is protecting their teammates, doing the right thing in the community. And we were really focused on that, as was everyone. But over the last few weeks, you have seen a lot of opportunities begin to pick up, whether they're small tuck-in opportunities or really large, as you say, what we call orphaned public companies who have been either poor allocators of capital or you know have made you know, haven't shown themselves to be great operators um, those are the opportunities that are starting to come uh to really good operators and people who have been good allocators of capital and good stewards of shareholder uh of shareholder value like us uh, and now we just you know it's just an excellent opportunity as you said as i said uh to start looking at more and more kind of deal flow and yes the deal flow has started to pick up pretty substantially interesting so, yeah, it's quite interesting because if you look at analyst reports from about two years ago, at least speaking in Canada, you always saw EBITDA multiples of anywhere from 10 to 15 times based on 2021 cash flow projections. And I go, well, that's pretty far out and, you know, a lot of hype built up into it. And now I can't help but think that, you know, those companies that are successful and can generate positive cash flow will be well ahead of the curve to compare to everybody else who's struggling. So, now. Absolutely. Building on that, Arthur, yes, because I do notice that sometimes within your portfolio, there are a few uh, early stage startup companies. Yeah. So what are some of the key indicators or benchmarks that you utilize when making those investment allocation decisions? Yeah, no, that's a good observation. Um, yeah, so when we started the fund, um, we, we operate more like a traditional venture capital fund where we would take early stage investments in private companies and when these companies went public was when we uh, typically, typically exit. Um, given the extreme volatility of the sector, um, we shifted our investment strategy um, last year. So, you know, the last few investments we made were along the lines of a senior secured loan or a secured convertible debenture. Uh, we're actually negotiating with a CBD company down in uh, Colorado um, for a royalty investment. Uh, that has uh, both revenue and positive cash flow. So, you know, when we look at um, new investment opportunities, um, we use a more holistic approach because at this stage of investing, um, you know, we can't really point to, you know, a revenue track record or a, a historical earnings growth. So generally speaking, we have a five prong approach to, um, to investing. You know, we look at the management team, their track record, their cohesiveness, the pre-money pre-money valuation, or is it in line with other public companies we've seen, or you know, is it a discount to the public company peer group? Uh, which specific subsector um, that they operate in? So, you know, currently right now we're we're underweight um, sort of the upstream sector, and we're overweight the downstream sector. Uh, the capital structure. 
and the timeline to revenue and positive cash flow. Um, and then, you know, if it's a more mature company, then at later stages, you know, we will look at revenue and cash flow and earnings growth. Um, but again, you know, to summarize, we, we look for a more holistic approach at this point. Excellent. So I want to switch gears a little bit because I'm very interested in this question to you, Jennifer, because one of the challenges in Canada is the regulations make it incredibly challenging to build a solid brand and market yourself. Uh, I noticed in one of the slides you're differentiating, you're showing your revenue per dispenser compared to some of your competitors. And obviously uh, you've done very well or the company's done very well. But what has been some of your approaches uh, in terms of building your own brand and marketing to be so successful in Massachusetts and Nevada? Well, so again, one of the things that's hard in the U.S. is you can't market across state lines. So that means you can't do like yeah. global advertising uh, because then you would get you would you'd be touching up against the the federal legality. Um, so it does make it at this point more difficult than like for coca-cola to go ahead and advertise uh, across the board you did there, there is that challenge but what we find is that if you offer consumers um if you offer consumers a great selection in your stores um consistently something new and exciting to try every time they come in but also always able to find what they're looking for their favorite item um mm -hmm and uh, excellent excellent kind of high quality products um, at a reasonable reasonable price, meaning like good value. Um, that really keeps the customers coming back again and again. But it's all about that high quality value add consumer experience. Um, it's very much about that consistency of that high quality consumer experience time after time that they come in your store. And I can't help but think that being vertically mm -hmm. integrated where you control your own genetics and everything else, you can probably mm -hmm. leverage off of that quite significantly by creating that unique experience that consumers really love and appreciate whenever you try new products mm -hmm. and things like that. Absolutely. And you can create that sense of excitement when you have a new strain coming into the store, when you've developed a new, I mean, we just developed something that's been going gangbusters in Massachusetts called Wicked Sour Gummies, which is the sour <laughs> watermelon flavor. And people love it. And people are really excited about it and being able to build that sort of sense of excitement with these new products that are right for the market um, is exactly what you need to do. It's not crazy different to being a craft brewer uh, yeah. where you're developing sort of something special for that area, but you're also reacting to consumer tastes broadly. You're also always wanting to provide good, you know, a great product at a good value. And Jennifer, uh, sorry to jump in. Um, no, go for it. Jennifer, do you find um, that there's a consistent top seller across all your dispensaries, uh, um, or do you mm -hmm. find it sort of varies by region by region? You know, right now it's very regional. Right now, there, for instance, there really aren't. As, oh, let me take that back. Again, flour is the biggest seller. That's what people like to buy. They like to buy flour, and. As a category, um, full spectrum vapes have become more and more popular. So it used to be people wanted just a vape with the highest THC content, but what people are now understanding is the value of the entourage effect, uh, having the right mix of cannabinoids and terpenes in an extracted oil so that when you have a vaping experience, it's a really um, kind of more rounded high, a more rounded customer, a more, more rounded rather consumer experience um, than just super high THC. So most popular is flour. Coming up are things like full spectrum uh, concentrates and full spectrum extracted products like vape oil. Um, but then when it comes to branded products like edibles or beverages or chocolates, um, it's quite regional. Uh, and what you have, in, even in Nevada, is very different to what you have in California. So because you can't cross state lines in the US, um, you don't really have the most popular California brands coming in and owning the Nevada market or Nevada owning the Colorado market or vice versa. Um, so you don't have as much brand connectivity today as you might um, in other sectors. Uh, it's really product specific, but over time we do expect things to go the brand route and again, to be driven by the need for consistent, high quality consumer experience, which right now means you must own and control your vertically integrated supply chain. 
Now, building on that, when, when you're talking about high quality, generally, uh, whenever I hear those terms, I usually think of it's a more of an expensive product, like your craft brewery, right, versus your regular, you know, uh, Bud Light or whatever, right? Someone wants that unique taste and feel and everything else. Does pricing factor a lot into your products that you um, supply? Yeah, you have to have you have to have value at every price point. So you need to provide something that's good value, even at the lower price point. Um, so you need to have high quality products there. And as you go to higher price points, you can absolutely have kind of a richer customer experience. Um, but that doesn't mean at low price points you can you can cut corners because certainly you know. There's a big market for people who want an accessible, high quality experience with the best quality experience they can get kind of for their money. Perfect. Well, I have one last question for both of you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll ask you, Arthur, first, sure. but in the short to medium term risks, what keep you up at night? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, what keeps me up is uh, profitability of uh, cannabis companies. You, you know, we're in earnings season and, you know, a lot of companies have uh, come out with their quarterly earnings. And, um, you know, I, I think cost control, like Jennifer said earlier, there was a period of time where, you know, guys were you know, spending like, like drunken sailors. And so there's a real rain down on operating costs and being good operators these days. So what keeps me up at night is, you know, these some of these cannabis companies that I think are very good companies, um, but, uh, you know, haven't quite achieved positive cash flow or positive earnings just yet. You know, while they have the financial resources and the stewardship to to get to that point in time. And, you know, as a, as an equity holder of some of these companies, you know, I, I, I tend to worry about that now. But the, the good news is that, uh, you know, we have seen uh, a few companies now that have come out with, you know, positive EBITDA um, and positive uh, net earnings, which is quite, you know, quite nice to see. So I think in that business life cycle or that industry life cycle that I alluded to earlier, we're, you know, we're finally coming on the, you know, growth slash uh, shakeout phase, um, which is, um, which is much needed in this industry. Excellent. Jennifer, same question for you. So in the short or medium term, what do you, are the risks that keep you up at night? Well, well, first of all, COVID is the scariest thing that I think has happened to the industry in a long time. Um, and who would have expected, you know, who could have imagined that, that, that COVID would happen? Um, but look, that being said, COVID has actually shown cannabis to be an incredible product. People have, as Arthur alluded to people have he, he, the demand for cannabis has just increased substantially during COVID um, and it's really shown cannabis to be almost alcohol like in its recession proof nature. Um, it's been helped by the fact that people consume it in smaller groups and disproportionately at home relative to externally. So COVID has actually really allowed cannabis to almost show what it's going to be when it grows up, which is an exceptionally powerful consumer product. So for me, that is, you know, that's been incredibly, an, an incredibly strong experience coming out of what has been one of the scariest times for, I think, us as individuals, at least in my lifetime. Uh, that's for sure. The cannabis has come out ahead, I think. Excellent. Well, Arthur, Jennifer, I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this session, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mark to say some closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. Well, James, best job moderating uh, that's been done. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and in closing, we're going to allow each of our presenters a final comment. So, Jennifer. Oh, well, I think as a final comment, I would just say thank you to everyone for taking the time. Um, uh, I do agree with Arthur that 2020 is the year that the cream will rise to the top. And when you're thinking about what is the cream, it's execution, it's valuation, and it's expectations for forward shareholder, you know, generation of shareholder value. And I think we uh, are a great company to have a look at on all of those scales. Yeah, no, that's a great point, uh, Jennifer. I, I tend to agree with that. You know, this is the first time that we're seeing companies with quarterly revenue approaching $100 million, which is not mm -hmm. insignificant. So so with that, uh, Mark, I, I'd like to just say to everyone, you know, stay safe and stay healthy.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer and Arthur. Uh, an excellent conversation after, and uh, we appreciate it very much. And to you, our attendees, thank you for your time today. Do go to the company websites and CDAR, learn more about these companies and check in at takestocklive.com. And until next Wednesday, 15 minutes after market close, when we will have technology companies presenting, be determined in your due diligence and ask tough questions. Mark and Raj, signing Thanks, out. Thanks, everyone. Take stock. Bye for now. Thank you.